Titus could be in the Lord's house tonight. We're going to stand up and turn to page 293 where we'll never grow old in the church hymnal while you're turning there. Does anybody here remember little Edward? He used to come to temple many years ago in a wheelchair. Anybody remember little Edward? Uh, came from the home up here. Uh, Edward was quite, quite a character. He wanted to sing this song every Sunday. And uh, uh, he'd sit right there in his wheelchair, and he'd, he'd want to sing this one every Sunday, and he'd always be two or three seconds ahead of everybody else on the chorus. And uh, every time I sing this song, I, I think about him. All right, where well, we'll never grow old. Mm -hmm. standing, turn to page number 120. It was requested that we sing this song, page 120, Victory in Jesus. <clears throat>
have every soul that's with us. Not a mistake. You're not a mistake. I'm not a mistake. And uh, a lot of folks need to understand that the church of the living God is a whole lot bigger than what's sitting in this building here tonight. Amen. But we welcome you to temple. And um, just pray that I've got something good to say tonight. It'd be helpful and beneficial. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. And verse number 10. First Corinthians 2, 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Lord, bless this holy word now. In your name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. Now, he's talking about the deep things of God. What do you suppose that might be? I've listed a few things here that are would be considered some of the deep things of God. But I, I do not believe it's exhaustive. I believe there's probably more involved than this. But I'm going to call your attention to John chapter number 20 and verse number 19. I'll read this for you. This is one of my favorite scriptures in the whole Bible. John chapter 20, verse 19. You can turn there if you want to. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. Note that fear of the Jews came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when it so said, he showed to them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. The apostle called us ambassadors for Christ. Then in verse number 22, and when he had said this, look carefully, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. He said to the apostle Peter, I give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Great controversy as to whether this was a temporal thing or this was a gift that he gave to his church in perpetuity. I personally lean toward the idea that it is in perpetuity, for I cannot really see a purpose in it running in a temporal time 2,000 years ago. Note carefully, he said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Men are the ones who breathe. He breathed into our nostrils the breath of life, and we became living souls. There's not a word in the Bible that says an angel or a cherubim or a seraphim or any other type of creature breathes. I'm talking about angelic now, an archangel or whatever. There's not a word that says they breathe. The only time that I suppose would be when they breathe is when they take on the form of a human being and they're in a body and therefore they are breathing because the scripture says you can entertain angels unawares. Breathing, therefore, as it relates to God is a unique thing because when he breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, he became a living soul. He said to Ezekiel, prophesy. And when he prophesied unto these bones, breathe, speak forth life in breath. And so it is. Now, that's the lessons to me tonight is this, that when the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament came upon the believer, the Holy Spirit now comes into the believer. And breath is a type of the Holy Spirit of God. It's important to understand this. Receive ye the Holy Ghost is a commission, a specific commission that he gave to these apostles and sent them forth. He gave them authority and power, and he sent them forth by telling them to receive the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Ghost came uh, not too long after that on the day of Pentecost, and he came down upon them and they breathed. They spoke because they spoke forth 16 different nationalities of foreign languages that none of them knew. But all the people that had gathered around knew because you had 16 different groups of people there to hear that day the wonderful works of God. So the Bible's full of mysteries. And that's one of the things that intrigues me about the scripture. It's full of mysteries. And it will reward you if you study it. 
And the best way to study the Bible is to take what men have said, the good men in their commentaries, read them, and then set them aside and pray that God shows you what's going on in the text. Because just because some man misses it or he spins it away doesn't mean that that's what the Holy Ghost wants you to have. Now let's look at some of the deep things of God. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 14. By their prayers for you, which long after you for the exceeding grace of God in you, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. That has to be a deep thing. Unspeakable and I want to give you a little Greek tonight. I want to give you a Greek word that's translated unspeakable. Anek diegetos is the Greek word. And here's what it means. It means incapable of being adequately expressed or uttered. That's the unspeakable gift. In plain words, there's no words that are strong enough to thank God for what he's done for us when he gave us his son. Words, words fail. Words are empty. That's the greatest gift that could possibly be given. This is why it's called an unspeakable gift. And don't you think that's a sad thing when men just overlook that, pass it by as if it were nothing? An unspeakable gift for someone who doesn't deserve it. I'm not worthy of that kind of gift, but he gave it to me. Search our hearts tonight and ask yourself a simple question. Are you thankful for that kind of gift? God made man. He knew why he made him. He allowed sin to enter in, but he knew what he was going to do about sin. And then at the cross at Calvary, the Bible said he made him to be sin who knew no sin. And now here we are today with the sin taken away. John the Baptist says he's going to take away the sin of the world. So what in the world are we living? We have a Savior who saved us from everlasting damnation. In 1 Peter chapter number 1, there is joy unspeakable. The Bible said, Whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Uh, unspeakable joy. Anekleletos. That's a big, these are two big Greek words that I've been quoting for you tonight. Anekleletos. And they, this word means unutterable, inexpressible. Inexpressible joy. In plain words, you cannot tell someone how much your soul is enraptured in what you have and who you are. Now, I don't have that tonight. It's been some time since I've had that joy of the Lord. You see, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. I don't have that tonight. You mean, preacher, you don't have the joy of God? Ever? No, I don't. I live in the same world you do. Amen. I've been going through hell now for about three weeks. Uh, three months, rather. And, uh, but I know who I believe. And I'm not turning loose of him. That's how I make it. So my faith hasn't changed. My salvation hasn't changed. My standing in state with God hasn't changed. But the joy, I'm looking for the joy to come. Because I know what joy is. I've had joy. And it's, it's one of those things that literally you cannot express it in words as to, as to how wonderful the joy of the Lord is. And uh, if you've never been saved, you have no idea what that joy is. The, guess, the best thing that an unsaved person can hope for is happiness. From the old English word hop, which actually has to do simply with your, your surroundings, your, your, what's happening to you, where you're located, where you, where you are. And so therefore, hap means that, uh, like for example, her hap in the book of Ruth was to fall upon the fields of Boaz. It's the thing happening in your life. Happening, see? Hap. So happiness has to do with what you relate to here on this earth, in your sphere, or where you exist. But joy, joy is the gift of God that ra raises you much, much, much higher to a higher plane. And I ask you tonight to pray for me that God will give me my joy back. It'll take a while. Don't know when it'll come. But I'm looking for my joy because I know what it is to have joy. Amen. I thank God for that. Now, the third thing that is, uh, that is uh, uh, the deep thing of God would be in Romans 11, verse 33. And here's what it says in Romans chapter number 11, and verse 33. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. I gave up on trying to figure him out. And if you've got half a brain, you know that the f full force of hell has been unleashed against this church. You know that. 
It's obvious. It's obvious to the, piece of, the people online. They're watching it. And uh, I would appeal to the people online, if you're watching this right now, uh, you pray for us. And uh, if you'd like to come down here where we are and support us, I'd appreciate that. It's easy to sit online and talk back and forth to each other. But maybe God will move your soul to come here and help pray against this, this gates of hell that have opened up against this church body. Amen. It's something else. In 47 years in the ministry, I have anything that has happened before this was a joke compared to what we've been going through. But we're going to go through it. Amen. I've done a lot of praying in the last few days, and God said, Now, son, you're going through birth pangs. I said, What do you mean by that? He said, you're going through birth pangs. He said, I'm about to do something at Temple Baptist Church that's going to be unique. It's going to be different. And I'm looking for that. So I hold on to him. And if you want to be part of it, then uh, pray. Because there's going to be a lot of ministries in this place. And God, uh, God is going to bless us with, that, uh, with what we need to do that. That's a wonderful thing, don't you think? I mean, if you didn't have that, what's the point? If I didn't have a ministry, why, why, get, why get up here in the pulpit in front of you tonight? I'm, I'm 77. I'll just go somewhere and fish. Retire. But I can't do that because I'm not the retiring type. And so I seek the face of God and press him and say, what are you going to do now at Temple? And he's telling me. And I'm excited about it. Don't let Satan discourage you tonight. There's a future here, and it's a unique future. Amen. And you know what the word unique means. He may even do some novel things here at Temple. The word novel means new. Just because you haven't seen it done before doesn't mean he can't do it. Amen. He can do above and beyond all that you ask or think. So just pray. Pray about what God's purpose is for us here at Temple Baptist Church. So he said his ways are past finding out. I can't figure him out all the time. Well, most of the time probably. But it doesn't mean that I don't love him and I'm going to serve him. Now, in Philippians chapter number 4 and verse number 7, another of the deep things of God is the peace of God. Can you imagine that peace, peace of God? Uh, there may be some folks out there watching me that your conscience is beginning to eat you alive. I don't know. And you can't rest. And uh, that's, that's not a problem with me. You can lay a six-month-old baby next to me and lay me down next to that baby. We both go to sleep. Amen. Amen. I have no trouble sleeping uh, whatsoever. You see, the Bible says, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. If you've got the peace of God, you've got something that confirms in your soul that there's something right and something good. Keep that in mind tonight. These are things that, uh, that make all the difference in the world. The peace of God that passeth all understanding. It'll keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. If you do any reading back in history, you'll find out that God's people in myriad different times have faced horrendous circumstances, but they, they retain the peace of God through it all. That's a supernatural peace. You can't manufacture that. You can't create it. It has to come from God. It's a, it comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, that peace now, uh, my joy, I don't have any joy tonight, but I've got peace. Oh, yeah, and I've got victory. Amen. How many of you have ever gone and didn't have your joy? Raise your, everybody raise your hand. We want to be honest in here, right? I'm not talking about a manufactured, uh, worked up flesh. I'm talking about the joy of the Lord. And uh, I've seen it in this place. And it's here and it'll be here. It's not going anywhere. Now here's another of these uh, deep things of God. It's found in 2 Corinthians 12. And this is the kind of thing that, um, that really ought to make you think. The apostle said in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 3, I knew him such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. He was caught up to the end of paradise. Now that's the third heaven. That's the third heaven. Uh, to help get a visual tonight, a lot of folks get confused with when I start talking about the first, second, and third heaven. Just imagine that uh, there are three basic orbits of the earth. Leo is the low earth orbit, okay? And that's what they send up their, their craft to. But then you've got a middle earth orbit. Then you've got a high earth orbit that's way out there. The higher you get up from the earth, the more your perspective you get of the fact that this planet is just standing, just sitting. Where is it sitting? What would you call it? 
Heaven. It's sitting in the heavens, right? Now think about that for a moment. The first heaven is for those little things down there. You can't see them when you get away. That's us, little specks down there. And we're walking around breathing the air of that first heaven that the earth is in. All right? That's what the kingdom of heaven was that Christ was preaching over there in the book of Matthew when he talked about the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The second heaven, just lift your head and look on beyond and you'll see the creation. You'll see, you'll see out here, you see planets and all the rest that your eyes can take in. That's the second heaven, all right? As far as the created heaven goes, that's the second heaven. Now what's the third heaven? The third heaven will not be seen with a natural eye. It cannot be entered but with a natural a power, authority. The third heaven has a door. And the apostle John said, I saw a door opened in heaven. And that third heaven is, can only be entered into through that door that opens. And then you go into a spiritual world that is the third heaven. And that's where God abides and that's where your loved ones are that have gone on, without, that have gone on before you, that have helped strip you as they say. They're in that third heaven they're in the presence of the Lord. You can't find it. You can't approach it. There's nothing, no spaceship can, no rocket can take you to it. You wouldn't even know where to go anyway. You can't see it. But that third heaven is there to open its door. Be absent from the body, present with the Lord. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Well, the Bible says here was caught up into paradise. And he heard unspeakable words. Now, this word is a retos. It's an easy one to pronounce. What does it mean? Unlawful. In other words, these unspeakable words you are not allowed to speak. That's what that means, you see. I've always wondered about it because, you know, we had a man in the church here 40 years ago, 45. He was clinically dead, and I remember his name. It's amazing that I do after all these years. But he'd sit in church... And he had this look on his face like he was there, but he wasn't there because he had been pronounced clinically dead. And he said he went off into some kind of a, what do they call it? You know, an experience, post uh, clinical death experience. And he had experienced things that absolutely blew him away. And he said, I can't wait till I'm gone because I had to come back and I didn't want to come back. Now, that's something when you think about that. And that's the way he was. And I'm sure he's been gone now. That was 40-something years ago. That's a long time ago. But I'll never forget him, and I'll never forget his name. And he was caught up into that place that it's unlawful, unlawful for us to utter. Now, in Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 26, this gets real personal. Here's what it says in Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Now, James says we have not because we ask not, right? And the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We know that we should pray. The Lord Jesus gave us what's called the model prayer. And uh, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's a prayer that I pray all the time. And uh, it's, it's, it's kind of prayer that uh, it has a lot in it, believe me. But he's taking, the, the Apostle Paul is saying here in Romans chapter number 8 that you can get into a place to where you, you think you know what you should be praying for, but you really don't know what you should be praying for. But notice how he says this. He says, the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Here's that word uttered again. Now this groanings is from the uh, Greek word stanatso. And it means this. It means a narrow, contracted, as when one is squeezed or pressed by circumstances. It's like you enter into, a, into, into something, hallway, use that as an illustration, and the further you go in it, the more the walls keep pressing in on you. It just literally cuts your life off, and there's nowhere to turn, you see. It's squeezing the very life out of you. That's what it says. That's what it means. And he says, therefore, the Spirit, when it takes over for you, is able to read what's going on inside your soul better than you can read what's going on inside your soul and intercedes for you to Christ at the right hand of the Father who's able to give us what we need. In other words, he's asking the Holy Spirit, 
All right. Christ, the Holy Spirit's asking God the Son to minister to us in a way that we could never do it ourselves. That's what Romans 8 is about. And this is groanings. And the word uttered there is aletas, aletas. And here's what it means. Describe groanings which are not capable of being adequ adequately expressed in words. So he does it with groans. He does it with deep sighing. Now in the last few weeks or months, have you gone into your prayer closet and just kind of got to where you really didn't know what to say, but your heart was broken and you began to pour it out to God and it just got deeper and deeper? And you felt something come on you and you felt a presence come about you and you felt someone begin to take you up and hold you and begin to present that to the Father? That's what's going on here. That's exactly what's going on. Crying out to God. This is one of those deep things in my book. Because this is the heart and soul of a Christian. If you're not praying, you're playing. If you're not praying, Satan has got you where he wants you. You see, your prayer is a weapon. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty unto God, the pulling down of strongholds. Prayer is absolute. It's absolutely necessary. There's no substitute for it. If you don't know what to say, preacher, I don't know what to say. You don't have to say anything. Just get down and pour your heart out to God. We say, how do I pour my heart out to God? Just come and bring your heart to him. That's what you do. This is how you get through things. This is how you do it. You get through them. You come to God. You've got to come to him. Satan wants to drive you away from him. Can he do that to a Christian? Oh, yes, he can. Yes, he can. And, an, and, a, and, a, and a Christian driven away from the light of fellowship with God will stumble practically as bad as an unsaved man. You need that light, that fellowship with the Father and with the Son. And the work of the Holy Spirit is to see to it that that fellowship is maintained. It's not up to you to keep it maintained. All you have to do is agree Agree with God. Learn to talk to Him. Learn to say, Lord, I've told you what all I think's on my heart, but surely there's more on my heart than I can think of. There's got to be more going on that I even understand or comprehend, so I bring it to you. Help me. And you know, just help me is a powerful prayer because that's gotten me through a lot of times. All I said, help me, help me. What did uh, Peter say out there in the water when he was going under? Save me. What did the thief on the cross say? Remember me. You see, these are simple prayers. This is why, and firmly in my mind and in my heart and in my soul, there are people out here that have been lied to by organized religion. They go to a church and they get a bunch of garbage. Well, you got to do this and you got to do that and you got to do this and you got to do that. No, you don't have to do anything. Just stop where you are and acknowledge that there's an almighty being above you and open up your heart to him. You'll be amazed at how you can get a hold of God. Man said, posted a thing under, the, under one of the messages. I read it just a few minutes ago. He's ex-Marine. He, uh, he, said, he said, I went off into combat. He said, they, he said they, they sucked my soul, robbed my soul, took my soul, and destroyed it. And then he said, I wandered around for seven years, I believe he said. And then he said, God led me to this page where you're on here preaching. He said, God led me to that. And he said, God has used you to restore my soul and walk with God. Then he finished it by saying, simplify. And every Marine knows what that means. Simplify, that's Latin. Semper fidelis, it means always faithful. That's what the word means. Any Marine knows it. He'll never forget that. And they talk to each other like that. And I'm glad to hear that because God restored him, brought him back from what Satan did to him. I would love to see that, wouldn't you? For everybody. Amen. I, have, I, I don't want in my heart and in my soul, and God knows my soul, I do not want to see anybody hurt. No, I have no desire for that. None. None whatsoever. So we read the uh, intercession for us, Romans 8, and then finally, it says in 1 Corinthians 2.10, the Spirit searcheth all things, 
But God hath revealed them to us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. And you could say this is complementing what goes on in Romans 8, because it's the Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit that's working in us. Now you have to ask yourself this question, and it's an easy one to do. It's an easy question to answer. I had a, a, a page that excoriated me, and uh, one of the people who watched the, uh, the uh, videos online uh, commented to that person that excoriated me and says, well, I got on your page and I looked at what you had on your page and said, you didn't, have, you didn't have one word on there about the Lord Jesus, nothing about the Lord, yet you took it on yourself to destroy that preacher. Well, I got on that page. I did a little research into the post that she had on that page. One sodomite post after another sodomite post. Pushing perversion and pushing perversion. Pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. Folks, if you've got half a brain, you'll think about what I'm saying tonight. To come and to destroy you. That's what they set out to do. This is what's going on at Temple. They want to destroy this preacher. They want to do away with me. They want to get rid of me. And they want to take over the, the building, the property, and the money. Pray against that. Would you do that? Pray against it. Ask God to raise up a standard against that. Yeah. Not ask anybody to be hurt. Just stop them. Raise up a standard against that. That's all. That's all. Just stop the people that are trying to tear this church apart. Is that, is that, is that a bad request? That are sending their stuff into this congregation, into the people, mailing it in, still are? It's not enough for them that half the church has got up and left. That's not good enough. They want it all. So they just keep on and keep on and keep on, keep on pushing. Does that say anything to you? When you see families torn apart and people hurting like you see them hurting here? Innocent people. And it's always that way. It's bad when the innocent begin to suffer. That's not, that doesn't stop them. They keep pushing and keep pushing, keep pushing. Does that say anything to you? Because I have never pushed against any of them. Not one time. So what will happen is it leaves in the hands of the Almighty. And they'll say, they say, they say, yeah, but you used that pulpit. Yes, I paid 47 years of my life to get, be in this pulpit. You buy one. You pay your dues. You pay your dues. Yeah, boy, you better believe it. When I went in the Marine Corps and that three, star, three stripes up and three stripes down, the first sergeant of our company stood out in front of us. I thought to myself, who the devil does he think he is? He's a first sergeant. That's who he is. <laughs> I found out real fast that he could take my liberty away from me and stick me in the squad bay for two weeks and I couldn't get out of the building. He's just a sergeant. But a first sergeant got a lot of authority. I had some smart Alex from up in Pennsylvania that I thought they were my buddies. They said, go in there and ask him where the first shirt is. First shirt. I had no idea that that was a derisive term. I found out real fast. I walked in there, cocky like, you know, I'm about 18 years old, and I walked up and I said, uh, uh, I, they've called me in here to see the first shirt. Oh, I think it was a corporal or a sergeant. That, okay, we'll get him for you. <laughs> yes, sir, buddy. He said, come in here. <laughs> and I went in there and stood before him, and he said, you call me a, I'm a first sergeant, not a first shirt. He said, you're going to stay in this, in this barracks for two weeks. You're not going anywhere. And there I stayed for two weeks with my smart mouth. You know something? I learned what first shirt meant. <laughs> learned it and I'll never forget it, boy. You see, that first sergeant was a veteran of World War II. He'd been shot at, shot up, blasted this, blasted that. He was an honorable Marine who'd served his country. He, had, he earned respect. He should, have been, he should be respected, absolutely. And uh, I didn't show him any respect, so I paid the price. That's the way it goes. You learn that in life, folks. You learn it in life. If you went up to Washington, D.C., and you walked up to the White House and said, I'd like to see Mr. Biden, <laughs> they'd say, who are you? 
Well, I'm me, yeah, but what standing do you have to walk in here and see Mr. Biden? Standing is a big thing when you come to the Supreme Court or anything of that nature. Standing. You don't have a standing. I could go up there. They didn't. You'd be surprised at the stuff the U.S. government does, and they don't say a word to me about it. They never call me. They don't contact me. They don't want my opinion about any of it. You know why? Because I have no standing. That's why. Now, if I were a U.S. senator that had been elected by the people of the state of Tennessee, I'd have standing. And I'd have a right to present questions and so forth because I represent a constituency, however many it may be, 10,000, 100,000, a million, two or three million, whatever. You have that. And so God has put me where I am by the grace of God. He's been good to me. And he has been, he's begun to communicate with me now in these last few days about uh, not, uh, you know, some things people would think of. He's communicating to me what this church is going to do. And I say, Lord, we're going to do it. He said, you're going to do it. And he said, I'll see to it that it's done. I'm going to open doors. And I'm going to bless Temple Baptist Church. And I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you. That's all I need to hear. Thank you. That's all I need to hear is thank you. And amen. And he's going to. And we can be part of that. Now, I hope you are. I hope that you, I hope that you support the ministry here at Temple. And uh, we do it. Father, bless your word. Time we have in your house. I hope I've said something tonight that's helpful and a blessing to the people. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Y'all, please pray for Brother Charles McLeod. Uh, he, he got home. He went home. But they did say he had a heart attack. So please remember him in prayer. Uh, my indication is that it wasn't a real massive heart attack, but a heart attack's a heart attack. <laughs> and, so, and so please pray for this, brother. Uh, does anybody have requests tonight? Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. He is. He's trying to destroy your faith. Yeah. He wants to turn you away from the Lord. That's what he wants to do. That's what he tried to do with Job. But, but don't let him. We'll pray for you and pray for your family. Yes, ma'am. God bless you. All right. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Amen. All right. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Amen. All right. All right. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. All right. Yes, sir. Hey, Amen. He may very well be in a hot spot soon. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. That's what Samuel had, neuroblastoma. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they've already been through this one time. Oh, yeah. That little boy, though, Samuel, before he left this world, he said, Daddy, I've got something to tell you. He said, Jesus came in here last night to see me. He said, he came in here last night to see me, and he told me that he's taking me home now. 
and I'm going to, I'm going to go home with Jesus. And he did. He, within 24 hours or something, I'll never forget that. And when little children start talking like that, folks, believe them. Amen. They're not full of guile like the adults. All right. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. You're who? Yes. Amen. Amen. All right. Yes, sir. All right. Amen. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Yes, sir. Amen, brother. Amen. 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 That was good that you went to see him like that. That was good, brother. All right. Somebody else? Yes, sir. told me that yesterday. Yes. And we want to thank Brother O'Melanick and his wife. They had the Thanksgiving meeting for the, uh, uh, for the senior citizens, and it was good. I mean, that was good food. I'd weigh 500 pounds if I ate like that every day. Good night. That was good food. All right. Had a good time. Good fellowship together with them. Good spirit there. It was wonderful. Enjoyed it. All right. Yes, sir. I know I've been praying about them down in Nashville. Yeah. Yeah, Harley. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's down there down she's down there being treated for a cancer. And uh and in uh, I don't know if it uh, it's maybe Vanderbilt. They've got quite a children's hospital because they took Samuel down there in 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 uh, Nashville. So let's pray for that that little girl. All right, anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. All right, Gloria. Yeah. Gloria How you're talking about. Yeah. Well, good. Amen. All right. Okay. She was up in, in Kingsport, Johnson City, Bristol, somewhere up in there. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Good night. <laughs> That's what we're in here for. <laughs> All right. Anybody else before we pray? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. All right. Okay. Anybody else? All right. We have a spoken request. Brother Tony Hall, will you lead us in prayer tonight, please? Thank you, brother. Sunday at 10 o'clock will be Sunday school, folks. And then our worship service at 11. Right here. 
We're glad to have you. Oklahoma. Good night, man. Well, we're glad to have you. Folks, try to get by and shake hands. Let them know we appreciate them being with us tonight. All right. God bless you now.